Thanks everyone. So I'm Louise Schoenfeld, I'm a postdoc at CSIRO and over the last year and a half I've been investigating indicator minerals for magmatic sulphide deposits using laser ablation, ICPMS and micro XRF mapping. So first I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who have helped me out, including my supervisor Steve Barnes, my office mate and colleague Margot Lavalliant, and the operators of the Synchrotron, the Maya Mapper in Melbourne, and everyone who graciously lent me their samples. So magmatic sulphide ore deposits are an accumulation of immiscible sulphide liquids from silicate magmas. This means that they don't have a very large alteration halo like some of the other deposits we've heard of today. Um, this makes finding them a little bit tricky. Some of the world's most valuable ore deposits are magmatic sulphide deposits, um, including the Norilsk uh, deposit in Siberia, which is one of my case studies and also the sample you see on the screen. These deposits contain lots of nickel, copper, and platinum group elements, which are becoming more and more important in our green technology age. So up to 50% um, of the lithium ion batteries are actually made of nickel. Um, so it's becoming higher, increasing demand for this kind of, these kind of metals. 100% um, of the world's platinum is occurs in magmatic sulfide deposits and 38% of the world's nickel also occurs in these deposits. So they're extremely important. They occur in small mafic to ultra mafic bodies which are extremely common around the world but very few are mineralized. So it'd be really good if we had an indicator mineral so when you found one of these deposits you'd be able to tell whether it's likely to be mineralized or it's unlikely to be mineralized. So this would save us money and in being able to target our drilling to areas that are more likely to be mineralized. So as we've heard already, for a good indicator mineral, we want a mineral that has a chemistry that's indicative of mineralization. It should be resistant to weathering and should be easily identified and separated. So my indicator mineral of choice was chromite. So Loch in 2018 suggested the hypothesis hypothesis that if sulfides are present in a deposit, the chromite that's formed in that deposit will have ruthenium contents lower than 150 parts per billion. Uh, this is because um, these magmatic sulfide deposits are formed in magma conduits and as they go past um, sulfitic country rock, the sulfide, sulfitic country rock is assimilated into the magma, which causes these immiscible sulfide liquids that interact with the magma and steal all of the ruthenium. So all of the chromite that comes out of these, these conduits have zero ruthenium in them, basically. So to test this theory, I looked at the largest single resource of nickel, copper, and platinum group elements in the world, which is the Norilsk deposit in Siberia. So this is associated with a huge outpouring of basalts um, in the Siberian traps, which was caused by a plume, and is also actually tied to the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. So I have the, the um, paper up there if you're interested in that, but it's a very interesting little story. So I was analyzing the chromites in Norilsk. The image you see on the screen is a uh, XRF image where the chromite's highlighted in green. So you can see there's a uh, sulfide associated with a bubble around it. And um, around the bubble, there are a whole bunch of chromites. And then there's chromites associated in the, the main body of the um, rock as well up, up there. Um, I found that there were two different chemical types of chromite in the Norilsk deposit. There were chromite that was trapped inside pyroxene, which had a chromium rich concentration. And then the chromites that are outside the pyroxenes and associated with the sulfides themselves have a more iron rich um, concentration. Um, I also did a whole bunch of different trace element analysis and I'm planning on using these as trace element ratios to see if I can find some other um, indicative chemistries for chromite associated with sulfidic, uh, sulfides. But thus far, for the hypothesis of ruthenium and chromite, all of the th ruthenium I've measured has been below 
the detection limit of the laser ablation system, which is five to 10 parts per billion. So I will quickly walk you through the laser ablation system at CSIRO that I operate. Um, so we have, it's two separate machines basically hooked together. There's a laser ablation machine that is connected to the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. Um, so the, the box that your sample fits in is about this big. Um, as long as it fits in that box, basically we can ablate it, but usually it is um, half inch, uh, one inch rounds, polished rounds. Um, but, and as, as we said before, the, it is a destructive technique, but it's very, very small. So you're ablating the size of human hair, basically. Um, and one other downside is that it is not portable. So you have to bring the samples to a lab to get this sort of analysis done. But it is very quick. Each analysis takes approximately a minute. You can do many, many isotopes at once, um, more than 30 if you want to. Um, it's fully quantitative. You can do individual mineral analysis. Um, the sample prep is quite mineral, minimal. You just have to cut it to a one inch round and a quick polish is all you need. Um, and with these systems, you can also do uranium thorium lead dating as well. So, Recently, we've been doing a lot of quantitative maps on the laser ablation system, uh, where you can get spatially resolved trace element data for minerals, um, which is fully quant quantitative with very, very low detection limits. So this is good because instead of drilling a um, large hole deep into your sample, you're just ablating off the first couple of microns, um, and which is also helpful. It can be very useful for measuring tricky elements like lithium, which we've been talking about a lot today. Um, so as Alex alluded to before, I helped Monica Lagrasse with her case study in the Green Bushes deposit where we were looking at iron piezoliths. So we mapped a whole bunch of these piezoliths to figure out where the lithium was. We knew that there was lithium in these piezoliths somewhere, but didn't know where. So doing these lithium maps, we could see that the lithium's actually contained within the cement of the piezoliths rather than within the cores themselves. And we can see that there's a whole bunch of variation in the chemistry of the piezoliths themselves. So if you're interested in that study, it's probably going to be presented at the Australian Exploration Geosciences Conference in Perth in September. So the laser ablation system is really good to be paired with other techniques such as the micro XRF mapping that we heard um, earlier this morning. So you can target key areas and allow for easier navigation of your sample. Um, I'm now going to take the chance to talk to you a little bit about micro XRF mapping with our Maya detector, which is um, which was created by CSIRO. So what you see on the screen right now is a uh, three color image generated from our Maya mapper where nickel is in red, copper is in green, and calcium is in blue. So you can see the um, pentlandite and chalcopyrite interactions in those veins. So we, we use the um, x-ray mapping to make elemental maps, as we heard before. Um, the Maya mappers, uh, the Maya detectors are actually attached to the uh, synchrotrons around the world. So there's one at the Australian synchrotron and then there's a few more in other locations around the world. Um, and this allows you to get a one to two micron spot um, and map uh, whole thin sections or rock slabs within a few hours at a one micron resolution. Um, we've also developed a lab-based Maya mapper which um, has about a 20 micron spot and has the same sort of detector. So rather than having to go all the way to the Australian synchrotron and get time on that, we have a lab-based um, mapper now. So I've included the references in the bottom of all my slides, so when you get the PDFs, you can read a little bit more about them. Um, the Maya mapper is uh, the x-rays are made by a liquid metal x-ray source, and then you have, I think it's 284 detectors all aligned on a detec detector pad. 
So you can get, it's quite high energy x-rays and you can, um, it's very, very quick analysis and you can get quite low detection limits. You can also map an area that's about 50 centimetres by 15 centimetres. So you can use it for quite large samples. Um, so the reason we've been using these Maya mappers is for um, platinum deposits. So with platinum deposits, you have a very large sample, um, but the platinum minerals are very, very small and very, very sparse, and they're very hard to see. And ideally, you would li like to sample where your platinum grains are, but where that is is pretty tricky to find out. But when we do use the Maya mapper, we can actually find where each of those little platinum grains is. So I've put a little circle around all of our platinum grains. So then we can specifically sample those areas. So then we can figure out the mineralogy and associations of those platinum grains. As we heard previously as well, you can also use these micro XRF techniques for quantitative textural analysis. And we think that we possibly have found a new indicator for magmatic sulfide deposits. So when we were taking all of these samples to the Australian synchrotron, um, we noticed that there were very complexly zoned pyroxenes. So these are magmatic sulfide deposits from all around the world. We have Finland, Africa, Russia, China, China again, and Spain. Um, and in each one of these mineralized deposits, we found pyroxenes. So clinopyroxenes are displayed in pink to purple zonations. Orthopyroxenes are shown in orange to browny green zonations. And we see that the cores have um, chromium enrichment. The um, outer zones are chromium poor. They quite often have oscillatory zoning and they also have sector zoning. So these extremely complexly zoned pyroxenes seem to be associated with the mineralization. When we look at the barren associated intrusions, they do not show any sort of zonation. So this is a big clinopyroxene crystal. You can see that the chromium content is consistent throughout the whole crystal. So we're still looking into this. Admittedly, we have a lot more mineralized samples than we do barren samples because all geologists are magpies and like shiny things. But um, we're looking at the more barren samples now to test whether or not this holds true. Um, one good thing is that you don't need the Australian synchrotron to see this type of zonation. So I've got three images on the screen here. One of them was taken with the Australian synchrotron, the other with the Brooker Tornado Desktop XRF, which we heard about this morning, and one that's just a thin section. And if you, you can definitely see it in the Desktop XRF, and if you know what you're looking for, you can also see it with your eyeballs. Um, just you can see the, the zonation around the edges and there's a bit of sector zoning in the middle there. So if you get your eye in, I think you could actually see it just in sample form as well. So the reason we think that these are occurring is we're in those magma conduits again, and as the rocks are assimilating from the roof and the walls, it's actually changing the chemistry of the magma. So as these pyroxene crystals are growing extremely fast, which cause that sector zonation, they um, move through a different type of chemistry because of the assimilation of the country rock and cause the outer zones to have um, different and oscillating chemistries. So that's all I have to tell you today. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Um, and thank you for listening.